looking forward to having the interaction with all of you and I do pray that um, everything turns out well and that we're able to share this with other people and that uh, it blesses everybody that joins us in, in coming together for this Q&A. And so, um, yeah, so I'm excited and I'm totally down for, you know, beginning. And so whenever, uh, I'm good to go, Jill. Okay, so far we do not have any questions. So maybe we should start with the firmament questions that we had on the website. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. All right, let me pull that up. And then uh, I have not completed fully the... Now, when you say on the website, can you send me the link and I'll pull up what I put together for um, you know, the... Sure the book that I'm working on that is connected to the same thing. Sure. I can read them as well, whichever you'd like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me just, that would be good, but let me pull this up first and then we'll go into that. Sounds good. And as far as if there is any question or any topic, of course, I'm not limited. Don't feel like there's nothing that, you know, it would be off topic. Um, I know that we've covered a lot of, uh, as far as information in all the different books that we have published and that we have shared, and especially in the radio broadcasts that we've done and the now over 1,000 videos that we've released. So uh, nothing's off topic. And wherever anybody would like to ask about anything, um, I'll be glad to field any question on anything. All right, I'm almost there. Also, if you didn't see it in the general chat, um, if you do have a question, you can type the question into general chat, or if you'd like to um, just go on live and ask the question, you can do that as well and speak directly with Ben. Uh, just let us know. Yeah, excellent. All right, yeah, I'm ready and so, Jill, if you want to ask the questions and then we can go for it. Sounds good. I am going right off the website. These are the three major questions that came in off of our um, of our advertising campaign for Firmament. Uh -huh. We have a lot of people coming in directly looking for the rest of the story about um, the, the Firmament from the Bible perspective and not a lot of answers available. So Zen has those, and I'm going to ask these right off the website here. And you can find this at sacredwordpublishing.com slash pages slash firmament. According to the Bible, what is the firmament and what is it? what is its purpose? Okay, the firmament is called in the Hebrew rakia, and it means to a solid extended surface. Uh, a broad expanse, and it's what divides the waters above from the waters below. And according to Amos 9.6, it is fitted to the circle of the earth, which was inscribed in Proverbs 8, inscribed uh, uh, upon the waters of the deep. And in the book that I published, Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth, I go into great elaboration on the Hebrew because I think it's very important that if you're going to do a word study and you want to come to know better what a certain passage or a certain chapter is about, that you have to read it in its fullness and context, but also look at the origins of the Hebrew for the Old Testament and the Greek for the New Testament to get a better understanding as to exactly what it is referencing. But um, also in that book, just so people know, I looked at all of the parallel verses which describe the first seven days of creation. And I laid them out in order, um, of course, with the King James first, but then all of the other passages and all of the other ancient manuscripts which go into great detail on the creation week. And so in that book, you'll find the first four days laid out from 
the King James Version of the Bible, the Aramaic Targum, the Chronicles of Jeremiah, the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, uh, Josephus's work, um, the Book of Jubilees, Jasher, and the Jewish Bible, and I'm sure there are a couple others that I am not even uh, including and mention here, but even the Greek word that is translated uh, and references the same thing as the Hebrew rakia, it is called stereoma, and it also it also speaks about a rigid, stable, hard, stiff, and unyielding structure. And this is the heavenly canopy, as I said, Amos 9.6 calls it the vaulted dome, the vaulted arch, uh, or what is in Isaiah 40.22 called the curtain, which is spread above the circle of the earth. And uh, one other thing really quickly, as far as the shape of the earth, it, it is my opinion that we see that in Proverbs 8, where um, the Most High re reveals and cites that uh, a circle was the Holy Spirit speaking there in Proverbs 8, um, but that a circle was inscribed upon the waters of the deep. I do believe that this circle was inscribed upon a square, and that's why we see reference in the Bible of the four corners of the earth, and that this square um, is the outer boundary, even though we see that the Antarctic wall uh, creates a circle or an ice wall around what are the waters of the deep, which um, which surround the continents, continents, the land masses, which are elevated above the waters of the deep. And in looking at, again, the various first four days of the creation week, we see that it is on the third day that the waters, um, that the earth is elevated above those waters. And so in the first day, you have the earth as a foundation laid and the heavens created and fitted to it. And then the vaulted dome being placed upon the, um, the circle and encasing it almost like a snow globe as we see portrayed in that particular image imagery. And then the dry land elevated above what is sea level. Um, according to the model that we now understand and the description of the first four days of creation, it is the sea level which divides uh, the waters again up below and what are now the dry continental land masses. And then it was on the fourth day that we have the luminaries placed into the tabernacle of the sun. It's also the what are the lower heavens below the vaulted dome, the first and the second heaven, that being the atmosphere and what we see described as the uh, outer space, what everybody believes to be outer space, but it's not ever expanding and it's not infinite. It is contained within this vaulted dome, this rakia, the stereoma, the canopy, which encloses and is fitted to the structure of the circle of the earth. And so this is the, in my opinion, the model of the biblical geocentric cosmology as described by scripture. Okay, and follow up to that, I was just double checking to what was the name of the book that 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 referenced all of the different texts? The Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth. Okay, one of us will post that in the chat. And then moving on to the next one. This is a big question. A lot of I've heard a lot of people ask this one. What is the firmament made of? It describes it, Josephus describes it, and also in the Chronicles of Jeremiah, they describe it as a quartz-like crystalline uh, substance. And so it is both, it's like quartz. It's, um, it's stone, um, but it's also, you know, it's an impenetrable barrier, but it, it's like the quartz-like crystal that also gives off 
what we see described in connection with the throne of the Most High God, the rainbows uh, that are often described as accompanying or being located or in connection with what is um, cited as the throne of the Most High God. And this is the same thing that we see in um, in Exodus chapter 20, where Moses and the 70 elders, they see the Most High God seated upon his throne. They describe a paved work of sapphire. And this sapphire is also associated with the throne of God as well, the color of sapphire for whatever reason. Um, in John the Revelator, in Revelation chapter 4 and also in Revelation chapter 15, he describes seeing the Most High God seated upon his throne and spread out before him a sea of glass like unto crystal. We see also in Ezekiel chapter 1 where he describes the cherubim and that the firmament is above their heads. He describes it as being terrible crystal or terrible looking crystal um and i forget exactly what that word terrible when you look it up but it's it's like awe inspiring uh if i remember correctly um the the verb that is being used there it's it's like awe inspiring or uh you know humbling um and so and also in Zechariah chapter 6, you see the same kind of reference and all throughout Scripture. Uh, one of the most detailed uh, descriptions of the throne of God and also the sea of glass like in the crystal is in Enoch chapter 18, where he's brought before the Most High God and he describes um, seeing you know, the, the crystal ceilings and wall and also the the throne, uh, the heavenly throne, the heavenly temple. And there's um, one other individual also describes all of this. Uh, it's in the, the Ladder of Jacob. And there's a text called the Ladder of Jacob, which is a pseudepigraphal text not many people know about. But he also describes in similarity the throne room of God in connection with this quartz like crystal like structure and also the the rainbows because I, I do believe that even when we see sun dogs or the sun or even the moon sometimes being reflected off of the firmament we see that rainbow the spectrum um in connection with that and i do believe that that is what it's you know the firmament that is casting and that causes the the spectrum to be divided as far as light and that we see it reflected in that manner. I am trying to gather some more questions. You've already yeah, answered sure. the third question, which was what does the firmament look like? Yeah, you said it was uh, the terrible a terrible mm -hmm. glass, so on and so forth. So let me pull up your Q&A off of fallenangelstv.com slash Q-A-with-Zen. I will post that in the chat. Uh, these are older questions from the past. Um, first one, you have been called an unconventional theologian. When did your interest in theology begin? Uh at a very young age, I, I had always been interested in mystery and the ancient mythologies as well as the religions of the world and the ancient manuscripts and study of them. And so ever since uh, 16, 17, uh, I began to read a lot of the ancient manuscripts and the ancient stories um, and it wasn't until, and I, you know, I'd studied a lot of even with the New Age traditions when I was younger and in my teens, and a lot of the Sumerian mythologies. Uh, but it wasn't until I acquired my disability that I was brought back to 
study of the Bible and also of the pseudepigraphal, the apocryphal, and those particular texts. And when I discovered that the Bible and other ancient manuscripts, which were biblically oriented, uh, and that spoke about the biblical narrative were prophetic that I understood and began to trust in more thorough manner what was being revealed within the the context of the the biblical traditions and the uh, apostol uh, apostolic uh, apostolic and also prophetic uh, the prophecies and the prophets and the patriarchs and the writings that they had uh, put down and which we have uh, inherited as legacy. And so um, understanding and reading that and knowing those to be the inspired word of the Most High God, I was then able to connect all of the other things that I had studied up until that time with what was revealed in the biblical narrative. And then I was able to um, which makes my work unique in that I have studied all of these other things. I was able to share uh, the underlying truth which connects all of these different uh, bodies of work as far as the ancient mysteries, the mythologies, the oral traditions, uh, even the conspiratorial side of what we are dealing with with the New World Order and together with the, the prophetic word. And so... I think that's what um, appeals to so many now in studying and examining and looking at the work that I've done is that I do bring forth uh, the connecting links behind all of these various topics and and areas of study. All right, change of context here. So Brian Barbecue says Ezekiel 28 mentions the fiery stones. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 14 is the specific verse. Mm -hmm. Do you have any explanation for that? Yes, um, the fiery stones, uh, in my opinion, I had always associated them with being the various wandering stars that they seem to be, and I had always thought, even before you know, coming to the geocentric uh, understanding of cosmology, I had thought them to be the planets. But I no longer you know, believe that these planets are connected to other Earth-like bodies as we see depicted in the heliocentric model, uh, but that there's another way to understand it now that I've recently come to greater uh, understanding on, and that has to do with what is described in Revelation as the various stones that make up the 12 gates of heavenly Jerusalem. And in different pseudepigraphal texts, like the Chronicles of Jeremiah and other rabbinical writings and ancient teachings, they speak about there being different um, stone, almost like the vaulted dome or the vaulted ceiling uh, connected to these different stones, and they make up a, a portion of what we see described as the, you know, the, the different structure of New Jerusalem. And so I have tendency now to believe that it's more connected to that in some way, uh, rather than just being uh, planetary bodies, um, because again, the planetary bodies, in my knowledge now, are just luminaries, and they are described as being water and light, and not earth-like or having solid, rigid structure. Um, but you know, again, nobody knows for certain, and uh, I'm just going by what I have studied and read within the uh, the other biblical uh, materials, but that still yet remains a, a mystery. Um, 
And so if anybody, you know, has greater insight on that too, I, I'd be glad to, um, to hear what anybody has to say on that. I have a... I have an interesting insight. Sure, please share. Sorry, I was having problems with the mic. Uh, if we look at Zechariah 3 and verse 8, it says, Behold the stone that I've laid before Yahusha. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says Yahweh Spelot, the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So it's talking about uh, the Messiah who has a stone laid before him with seven eyes. And we know in a, uh, later descriptions that he has these eyes of the flames of fire. And in Revelation, it says that the Messiah has the seven spirits of God. And we know that uh, these seven eyes in this stone is the, the seven spirits of God. And they're described in Revelation as uh, the seven fires which are burning before the throne. Huh. So that's a very interesting connection. Yeah. Um, I do believe also that if you look at the legends of the Jews, that there is a description in more elaborate manner as to what I was talking about with the different stones and their connections to uh, what are cited as even the, the seven heavens um, and the different components the structure of new jerusalem but yeah again you know nobody knows and has all of the answers and that's why it's good for us to come together in the way that we are now to uh really learn from each other and to kind of explore these topics in greater depth i'm looking at it now so i'll see if i can find what i was talking about and I'll share it later. Okay. What is Zen working on now? What books does he expect to release next? And what is capturing his thoughts these days? Now that's like a three-part question. So best of luck. <laughs> Um, well, I just finished what are called the primary Adamic books, um, and that is a, a, a fascinating, and I'll, I'll actually bring that up and share with people more, because uh, it's something that I just finished yesterday. So let me bring that up, and then I'll share from the Legends of the Jews, the what it says about the second day and that will give people more insight i believe into what we're talking about but this also falls in line with a show that we're going to be doing this upcoming uh thursday the bishop of the modern thracian church the brother of dr stephen guide who was the author of the thracian script decoded books one through four will be joining us for, um, and he only speaks Bulgarian, uh, so he'll be joining us with his interpreter, but he will be joining us for a live show and he'll be fielding questions on the Thracian script decoded as well as the Thracian Chronicles. And I know that there's great deal of interest in these particular texts. And so what I did with this primary Adamic literature, and if people don't know what that is, the primary Adamic literature are the different ancient manuscripts which make up and are specific to the life of Adam and Eve and reveal and speak about the, uh, the fall of humanity, their initial banishment from paradise, and their exile here to the earth, and what it was how it was like for them to transition from losing their bright nature and then being placed into mortal flesh form. 
and being exiled here to the earth, uh, the fallen earth in a fallen state, where the other rebel angels, Satan and the one-third of the angels, which had joined him in rebellion and waging war against the Most High God, they were banished here on the second day. And I do believe that the structure of the firmament was put into place on this particular day and that the war in heaven uh, led to what became the destruction of the first world age and the earth as it had been previously created. And that this led to what we see in Genesis 1-2 as the earth becoming without form and void. And when you look up the Hebrew for those particular terms, it is tohu wa bohu, and it means that the earth became haya is the the Hebrew word there for became or become or was or is. Um, but it's more specific that the earth became. And then it says tohu wa bohu. Tohu means a deserted wasteland, and bohu means uh, indistinguishable ruin. And so we see that in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, that it says that the earth was created or that the earth and the heavens were created initially perfect and to be inhabit, inhabited, but then something occurred which led to their destruction. When you look up those particular terms without form and void, you find that the only other place that they are repeated are in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 30. And it speaks about there the destruction of the first world age as well, and as it's also cited in Second Peter, uh, where he speaks about the world that then was uh, and how it had been destroyed by a flood. And this flood was not um, the flood of Noah's day because it completely destroyed everything, uh, whereas the flood of Noah's day, um, it didn't completely wipe out and destroy the earth so that it had to be reformed, as we see being described in the verses that follow after chapter 1, verse 2. But anyways, um, we see in that passage in Jeremiah, chapter 4, it speaks of a time when the birds of the heaven fled and there was not yet any man. And I do believe that this is also referencing in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 7, before Adam and Eve had been created, that it speaks about a time when the, there was not yet rain and there was no man yet created to till the ground, and that the earth was watered by the dews, that there was a mist that went up from the uh, the earth uh, every day, and that's what watered the the creatures and the plants that were already here, uh, and that there was not yet a cycle of rain and storms and the whole uh, dynamic of evaporation and condensation that that came afterwards. Um, and I do believe that the firmament being put into place and dividing the waters above from the waters below and then the sun and the moon being placed into the firmament on the fourth day, that the sun and the heat that it creates as it moves back and forth between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, that that's what creates the condensation, the evaporation, and also the fluctuation as far as the uh, high and low air pressures, which creates the storms and the movements of the rains and the whole cycle of you know the the rains and the earth uh, being flooded by the rains and uh, the evaporation and the water rising into the skies and then gathering as clouds um, all of that is dependent now upon the movement of the sun and its interaction with the the land and also the oceans as it uh, dries up um, with its heat and the the waters that are on the earth and also within the ocean. Um, oh, oh, so anyways, let me return back to the primary Adamic 
literature. And so in this particular book, I decided to put together the first chapter of the Thracian Book of Atamanua and the last two chapters of the Thracian Book of Atamanua together with all of the other primary Adamic literature, which includes the Apocalypse of Moses, which is a, a Greek translation of the life of Adam and Eve. Then we have the Latin and the Slavonic, the Vitae Atom et Eva, which is also, it's Latin for the life of Adam and Eve, and together with the, the Book of Adam, which is a Georgian uh, life of Adam and Eve, the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, otherwise known as the first and second book of Adam and Eve. This is a, an Egyptian text, and it is contained in the Forgotten Books of Eden, uh, the Forbidden Books of the Bible. Um, you can find these, these two, and, and they're the most lengthy as far as the life of Adam and Eve, uh, most complete in my opinion. And then there's also the Testamentum Adami, which is an Arabic and Ethiopic text. There's two translations. Uh, and that just means the Testament of Adam. And I also, we have already recently uh, released in other books, the Cave of Treasures, which is a, a Syriac text, the Book of the Bee, which is an Armenian text, and the Chronicles of Jeremiah, which is a Hebrew text. And all of those also have and provide in great detail stories about the life of Adam and Eve. And so I put together all of this information in one book, and we just released it uh, yesterday, and I did publish the hardback today. Um, but it is now available with these three chapters of the Thracian book of Atom and Ua, which is in my opinion, the oldest and what I believe to be the origin for all the others. And the reason I say that is because they contain chapters which are not found extant in any of the other renditions. And they reveal uh, specifically two concepts which are very controversial, which I've been working on in elaborating in great detail in many of my other books, uh, that being that the Holy Spirit is the feminine aspect of the Godhead, and that what is described in Genesis chapter 3 with Eve beguilement is actually her being seduced by the serpent, and that this led to the birth of the the child of the wicked one which is described in first john chapter 3 verse 12 that cain who was of that wicked one and when you look up that word of it it's uh, the greek word echianos and it means the son of the child of or the offspring of and so what that passage is actually saying is that cain who was of meaning the son of the offspring of or the child of the wicked one, Satan. Which, for those that know and have studied my work, you know, I bring this information out in great detail and describe it in in many other, you know, different from other ancient manuscripts. And two of my books, Lucifer, Father of Cain, and also um, the Great Contest to my 12th book, Enmity Between the Seed Lines, that I go into great elaboration on those two premises. But um, really quickly, I'll, I'll share here that from the, from the Thracian book of Atamanua, it says in the first chapter, this is a portion of it, and it says, and this spirit, the one saw and loved with all his wish, this is why the spirit of love is the one, the creator of life, which became the mother of everything. Because of his love, the one wanting to wish into being the spirit manifests life appearing for the first time as the is, which meaning see, references he who sees everything. And because he could see everything, 
He created everything, for he had the power to create being. And the one giving, that is, Nute, was his father. And the outpouring of light from the one, Rhea, was his mother. Born from the two, he was their son, the only begotten son of the father, that is, the Almighty One, who sees everything. His name is Isis, which means Jesus. Um, in the Thracian, again, the, these particular texts uh, affirm that the Thracian people were Christians and they knew about the coming of Christ. Conceived from the womb of Rhea, that is, Rhea, God, Yah, the Word, also the co equal to the Father. He is the consciousness of his Father who is Nute, that is, the only one who gives. And so, you know, that's just a portion and it fits in line with what we see revealed in John chapter 1, which is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so this first chapter of this ancient Thracian book of Atamanua describes in great detail this particular process but as i said you know one of the most controversial aspects of its um revelation is that it affirms as i have that the holy spirit cited as wisdom in proverbs which is the greek greek word sophia and also the hebrew word shokma that she is the feminine aspect of the godhead and that we see the human family is also a reflection of the triune Godhead being the father, the mother, and the son. And so Adam, uh, Eve, and uh, Seth, uh, because Cain was of that wicked one, they also represent a reflection of this same concept. And so this is one of the books that I've been working on and that I just released and finished. Uh, another book that I'll be working on so that because we have the the Denver Flat Earth Conference coming up, I'll be working on a kind of Flat Earth Firmament 101 where I'll be answering many questions which relate to what we are talking about here with regard to the firmament and also the... Um, I'll be putting together and answering many different questions on the structures of the heavens, um, you know, the, what is the firmament, uh, all the different questions. And we can go into that in more elaboration here in a short bit. But I wanted to also share uh, that another book that I've been working on and that I plan on releasing very soon is called the ancient prophecies of christ and it was this particular book which i wanted to bring forth the prophecies that were contained in all of the extra biblical the pseudepigraphal the apocryphal um uh, many other texts which a lot of people have never heard of which speak about the prophecy of the coming of christ and how um they knew, even like with the Thracian uh, Chronicles, they knew that he would be born of a virgin. He would um, be from the town of Bethlehem, that he would be uh, of the tribe of Judah, uh, and that he fulfilled, as we see in the Levitical 23, the feast days, that when he came and took on incarnation in the flesh form, that Yeshua was uniquely different. He was not like uh, a normal human child. In fact, when he entered into the womb and first came out um, of his mother, uh, Mary, he told her that he was here to fulfill the prophecy and to rectify the fall and to redeem humanity and that he was Savior Messiah. And so, and ever since he was a young child, as we have revealed in another collection of the different manuscripts we've put out called Yeshua Christ in Infancy, Early Childhood, and Lost Years, 
that Mary knew even uh, as, a, as a child, she would often share his bath water or his swaddling clothes with people that were lepers or that had um, that had succumbed to disease or that were cursed in some way or that were having difficulty or trouble, uh, that she would heal them with just his bath water. Because even at that young age, even as a babe, he already had the healing powers that we see uh, him utilizing during his adult ministry. And there's many stories in the infancy gospels that speak about how Yeshua, even as a child, he had the power to give life and to resurrect children even back then. For instance, there's a story of how he was accused of pushing this young child off of the roof and that this young child had um, succumbed to death and his parents had accused Yeshua of, of murdering him, of pushing him off the roof. And so he resurrected the young boy. The young boy came back and said, and he asked him, um, did I push you off of the roof? And he said, no, Lord, uh, because even back then, all the children that were around him knew him to be God. So they addressed him as Lord. Uh, and even his instructors, you know, because they tried to take him to regular school and he, there was no instructor that could teach him anything because he already knew everything and that he was wiser than even they. And so uh, there was no point for him to even go to school. So he never, never did. But um, all of these different stories, it shows us and talks about how even as a young child that he had the authority over life and death. Uh, there are stories of, for instance, he saved um, uh, or Mary had saved with the bathwater again of Yeshua um, what became the Apostle Bartholomew. Uh, this story is included. And even Judas had, even when he was young, he was already being possessed by Satan and he tried to attack Yeshua and to bite him and he punctured him on the side of his where he would later be pierced and all of this was prophetic um, just a couple more stories just to give you a better idea of the things that I'm talking about but also James his brother uh, and for those that don't know James Thomas um, the the different individuals that later came to be uh, the apostles they were his half brothers that Mary was a virgin all throughout her life. She never had another child, even though most people believe that she and Joseph um, had other children. That's not true. And, and if you read and study the, the extra biblical text in great detail, you see that Joseph was an elderly widowed man uh, and that he had a number of children from a previous marriage when he took Mary from the temple uh, and was to be her guardian, that he was already elderly and widowed. Um, and Mary was 16 years old when she birthed Christ and she was her caretaker. Uh, there's another story which, because Joseph did not want to take on Mary as, you know, his wife or to be her guardian because he was already old and elderly, but the Most High God brought forth a, a sign. And many people know that in Isaiah, it speaks about um, that there would be a sign. Uh, the, the stem of Jesse would bring forth a, a bud, um, uh, the rod of Jesse. Well, that actually was fulfilled in that during the, the time of the early patriarchs, all of them were shepherds and they carried staffs many of them all of them carried staffs and many of them were shepherds and they would bring forth their staffs uh, for for this particular story simeon the high priest he wanted 
to know what to do with Mary because she refused to marry anybody. And they didn't know what to do with her now that she, when she turned 14, all the virgins left the temple. And so the high priest prayed about it, and God told him to have all of the the patriarchs of the 12 tribes to bring forth their staff. And uh, Joseph was um, one of the elders. He refused to bring forth his staff the first time, but he brought forth his staff uh, after there was no supernatural sign. And when he did, the, a rose budded from the top of his staff, and a dove came and landed on the staff. And so he was given uh, Mary and to be her guardian. And so that was a fulfillment of that particular prophecy in Isaiah. But anyways, there's a story of James, who was the half-brother of Christ. He was bitten by a viper, and he was dying. And Christ came, and he showed that he had authority even over the vipers. He called forth the viper and from his hiding place in the a wood pile and had him suck all the poison out of James. And then the viper exploded. Um, and so there's other stories also of um, the dragons. There, there was that there were actual literal dragons during that time. And there was a story of how Yeshua, as an infant, that he walked and led his parents through this really particular dangerous part of the forest where these dragons. Um, were known to assail people that walked through that particular area. And the dragons all bowed down to Christ. Um, that even when he was a young child and when he went to Egypt, all of the idols fell before him. And this same thing occurred during the time of his trial uh, when he was brought before Pontius Pilate that all the banners in the story of the Gospel of Nicodemus, all the banners bowed before him, and then all the idols fell down on their face. And so these kind of supernatural and miraculous signs always accompanied, uh, accompanied him and showed that you know, he truly was God incarnate. And so that's another one of the books that I'm working on, and I still have to do The Great Contest number three, the sons of Anak, and um, and so that's kind of what I've been working on. Sorry, that was a really long answer. It was a very long question as well, so <laughs> that's great. All right, next one is from Doc Michaels. It is, let's see. Any plans to share more of the extra biblical writings along with our friends Flatwater, Flat Earth's readings? in a live show? Um, you know, I have been trying to get Glenn, which is, that's the name of Flatwater, um, to join me for show. I even invited him a long time ago to do like a monthly broadcast with me, but he does not like to be in the public eye and does not want to do live shows. I don't know why that is, but, um, for whatever reason, he decides to remain in the background. And so I respect him. I, I still have great uh, admiration for the things that he's done, and he certainly has brought forth a lot of incredible truth. And uh, But I, you know, I do wish that he would work with me in greater collaboration because I think that his work and my work stand as confirming witness for one another. Uh, in the various strange aspects of uh, the biblical cosmology that we have both brought forth. For instance, the whole thing of there being um, the whirlpool at the center of the earthen plane at the North Pole, which sucks the waters of the oceans in and then every six hours uh, changes course and expels them, creating what is the high and low tide. Uh, Flatwater was one of those that was early on in reading the text of the Inventio Fortunata, which speaks about this particular phenomenon. 
And it was one of those things that I revisited in the text of Virgil, the Aeneid, and also the um, Odysseus, is his travels in the Iliad. And it speaks about Charbridus, which is this supposed to be this giant sea monster, but it's described as a whirlpool. And so um, in re-examining and revisiting those texts, I also brought out in this firmament book knowledge that what is being depicted in those particular stories is this particular structure, which is again found at the North Pole, um, which I also connect to the testimonies of Job in chapter 26, where he speaks about hell being naked before the Most High God. Um, and in Enoch in chapter 18, it describes the great abyss and the waters um, that are gathered and, and that are drained in spout. All of this is connected in a similar manner when you have greater understanding of the biblical cosmology. And I bring all this forth in my newest book, which is, um, well, not my newest, but my newest on the, the cosmology is called Paradise, the Sides of the North and the Mount of the Congregation. All right, this one is from Brian Barbecue again. Going back to Adam and Eve, what were the peoples that Cain was fearful of being harmed by and went by when he was cast out and given and given the mark of protection? Are these the creation of the Elohim from Genesis 1.26? And what became of those people? Yeah, really good question and really good insight. Or with regard to the question, I can see that this individual is very knowledgeable. And yes, I, I do believe it's two aspects. First, that the pre-Adamites pre that were created in Genesis 1.26 through 28, we see that these particular beings were created before modern humanity, which is cited in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that Adam was created and placed into, into paradise. He was not created on the earth. But the pre-Adamites we see in Genesis, and I'll actually pull it up, that in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, the pre-Adamites were created in multiple couples. They were created male and female, and they were created on the earth and told to multiply and to replenish the earth because, again, the earth had just been reestablished when it had previously been destroyed in chapter 1, verse 2. And you'll notice also that in this particular passage, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so the, this particular being was made for the earth and on the earth and to rule over the earth and all of its creatures. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. When you look up those particular, the in the Strongs, you'll see that where it is describing God as being a he, those particular, um, those particular words are not found in the original text. It just says God, um, Elohim, which I take to be the Holy Trinity, because we see in chapter um, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, it says that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, which is the Holy Trinity, is the one that created the heavens and the earth and also modern humanity and, um, and the pre-Adamites. Uh, and so anyways, so God says male and female created them in their own image. And so, in my opinion, that shows us that there is a female aspect to the Godhead. 
And again, as I reveal in my work, the Holy Spirit is that feminine aspect. Um, continuing, we see God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. And so here is when, you know, the pre-Adamites were created on the earth. They were created in couples and they were told to multiply, which is something that was not told to Adam and Eve because first they were not created on the earth and they were a special creation. They were given the breath of life, made in the image of the Most High God, uh, in you know the direct image and and then we see that um, in the stories of the primary Adamic literature as I brought forth Adam was a, a bright natured immortal being and they were not yet in flesh form uh, until they had fallen and when they had fallen then they were placed under the authority of death and they were banished here to the earth and so we see that, you know, again, um, in chapter 2, verse 7, uh, that the Lord God, which is Yahweh Elohim, creates Adam and then takes Eve from out of his side and then creates woman. And Adam and Eve are then separate male and female. Um, and, and they were fell from paradise and then where it says after they were tempted and ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge good and evil that this is when they are placed into flesh form and when they are placed into flesh form that's when they take on human mortality that's when the serpent impregnates eve with cain who becomes the firstborn of the wicked one and that's why it says in chapter 315 um, that this is where the enmity would be created and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed when you look up that word seed it is the word zera in the Hebrew and it means children offspring descendants and so what God is saying here to the serpent because um, after they were tempted and they fell, he addresses the serpent first. He says, Thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was the oldest prophecy between the enmity that would take place and that would occur all throughout history between these two particular bloodlines. And so we are we see in Genesis 3 that the serpent is cited as having seed and as having his own bloodline. And then that's why in chapter uh, 3, verse 16, then God says unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception because he knew that she was already pregnant with Cain and also with Abel because when Adam repeated the act and he ate also from the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he repeated the sexual act with Eve and impregnated her with Abel. And so the this particular passage, enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, we see that that was fulfilled with Cain murdering Abel, because that was the he was the first casualty of this war between these particular bloodlines. One last thing I want to bring forth with regard to the pre-Adamites and who Cain was in fear of. If you go to Genesis chapter six. Let me pull it up. This is a very interesting passage. In Genesis chapter 6, it tells us, 
And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, everybody assumes, and we connect this passage to the time of Yared, which Yared um, means descent, and he was the father of Enoch. And it is assumed that the sons of God came down during this particular time. But if you read closely this particular passage, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, when was that time? Well, we just had read it. We just looked at it. That was in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And so it's actually telling us there that the sons of God, which I believe this was before the 200 watchers descended during the time of Yard, and that the rebel angels, Lucifer and the one-third of the angels which rebelled, and that went to war against the Most High and that were cast down, they were the ones that intermingled with the pre-Adamites. Remember, it says here in verses 126 through 28, and then God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So in my opinion, Satan and the rebel angels they came where it says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply. That was 126 through 28. And so Satan and the rebel angels involved themselves with the pre Adamites and they created a race of giants even before the 200 watchers came down to the earth during the time of Yared. And that's why, in my opinion, we see that. In the oral traditions and the histories of the megalithic structures, which we find worldwide, for instance, Baalbek and Pumapunku, that the indigenous peoples that live in those areas say that these things were constructed by giants. And in my opinion, there were giants here upon the earth before even the modern creation of humanity. And so that's why we see, again, in the, for instance, mud fossils and, you know, the stories of the Titans uh, that these really massive giants um, be before the modern creation of humanity that now are entombed and embodied in mountains and different uh, structures that we see all across the world, the, these different mountainous structures, that these were the giants that were created from the incorporation of the sons of God, the rebel angels, with the pre-Adamites. And so, in my opinion, these were the beings that Cain was afraid of uh, when he spoke about, you know, the uh, of having fear of retribution being brought upon him um, during the time when he was to be cast out as a vagabond. And so in my opinion, there were already giants upon the earth during that time. And Cain was in fear of not just the pre-Adamites, but the giants that were here upon the earth, as well as the rebel angels that took on embodiment in the form of what are the Anunnaki, the dragons, the seraphic, uh, looking beings, the feathered serpent, which was worshipped worldwide during the antediluvian times. And we have a question from Kylie J. Buckley. Bear with uh, me. Hey, Kylie. Hi, Zen. I have been wondering if Yahusha and the disciples of his day took the Sabbath on the functions of the moon or another calendar since Mr. Gregory, the Gregorian calendar, was formed in 1582. A uh, really good question, and one that I'm really glad to be able to address, uh, because tonight is the thwar third quarter Sabbath moon. Uh, and for those that have examined and studied and looked into the different calendars, 
you know that the Gregorian calendar uh, is disconnected. It's divorced from anything with regard to the heavenly luminaries. But if you look up the Targum, which for those that have not studied, Targum means translation. And the Aramaic Targum that we now have uh, and that we have published and released, it's the oldest translation. It just Targum just means translation, but it is the oldest rendition of what are the Hebrew, the Torah, the Pentateuch, or what most people know to be the Tanakh. You can find a, a free copy of it available online at Targum.info. But these particular texts give great detail, greater detail, in my opinion, than any of the English translations of the Hebrew Torah. And looking at the passages there in Genesis, speaking about the creation of the great luminaries, it tells us that, it says, and let them be for luminaries in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And the Lord made the two great luminaries, and they were, oh, wait, let me go up. Uh, I need to go one passage up. And it says, and the Lord God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to distinguish between the day and the night, and let them be for signs and for festival times times and for the numbering by them the account of the days and for the sanctifying of the beginning of the months and the beginning of the years and the passing away of the months and the passing away of the years the revolutions of the sun the birth of the moon and the revolving of the seasons and so here in this passage we are told that it is the revolutions of the sun and the moon and the other luminaries which create the determinations of the different aspects of time, which is exactly what I learned when I was able to decipher the Book of Enoch's courses of the heavenly luminaries. Because in those four chapters, 14 chapters of that particular book, Enoch describes in great elaboration the movements of the sun, the moon, and the stars. There's not one passage describing any motion to the earth. And he tells us, Enoch describes in those passages, how it is that the sun and the moon move back and forth between what he describes as the six gates of heaven. And basically, Enoch um, describes the calendar system that when the sun is located above the equator for the vernal equ equinox, that starts the beginning of spring and then for the next three months the sun moves through what are called the fourth fifth and sixth gates of heaven until it reaches the tropic of capricorn for the summer solstice and this being the longest day of the year it is the beginning of summer and then the sun reverses course and begins to move down towards the tropic of capricorn and for the next three months, it will move towards the equator through the sixth, fifth, and fourth gates until it reaches the equator again for the autumnal equinox, dividing night and day in equal 12-hour portions. And then this begins the season of fall. For the next three months, or the next 90 days, the sun will move and this will be in southern latitudes that begins spring for the people that live in, for instance, Australia, Brazil, or South Africa. And that begins fall and winter for us. And so when the sun crosses the equator and begins moving towards the Tropic of Capricorn, this creates for us the beginning of fall. And when it reaches the Tropic of Capricorn, and it's the furthest away from those of us in northern latitudes. That is the winter solstice, and that begins the three months of winter. And then it will be it will reverse course and begin moving back towards the equator for mm -hmm. 
the beginning of spring. Did somebody have a question or something? But um, I need to elaborate just a little bit more on this before we take another question. Um, and so anyways, and then in the second portion of the book of Enoch, he describes the motions of the lesser luminary, which is the moon. And Enoch tells us that the moon sets the, the, the Sabbath because it's the moon, the phases of the moon are divided into seven day segments. And so according to the book of Enoch, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, when you see the moon appear as a waxing crescent, that that is the beginning of the new lunar month, which for us that happened on, on August 12th. That was what is called Kadesh, which just means the time of the new moon. And that's when the waxing crescent first made appearance. And then we had on the 19th, which was my birthday, birthday we had the first quarter moon. Um, and then on the, the 26th, um, the, the full moon, and then where we are now on the 2nd of September, this is the third quarter Sabbath moon. And then we'll have in seven days, next Sunday, what is the lunar conjunctive moon. And so each one of these quarterly phases actually determine the Sabbaths. And it is the, the phases of the moon which determine that because if we did not have a written calendar and if nobody had any calendar in any existence anywhere, nothing written down, the calendar is written in the stars. And we can look, and because we know that we are, you know, um, moving into fall, actually September 21st will be what is the vernal equinox. And that's when the sun, the sun is uh, upon the equator. That will be the beginning of fall. But for right now, um, the, as far as the Sabbaths and also the Levitical feast days, all of that is determined by the moon. And so if we did not have any written calendar and we weren't going by the Gregorian calendar, we could tell just by the, the movements of the moon and the sun where we are in the year. And so, um, and that can all, you know, all be determined again by when the day is equal 12 hour and night uh, 12 hours day, 12 hours night. That is the vernal equinox and also the autumnal equinox. The longest day of the year is uh, June 21st. That's the summer solstice. December 21st is the winter solstice. That's the longest night of the year. But um, as far as each of the lunar months, they always begin with the waxing crescent. And so when you see the very first sliver of the moon right after sunset, uh, that's usually when it makes its appearance because the moon, when it's in lunar conjunctive phase, it moves with the sun and that's why we're not able to see it because the brightness of the sun um, blots out the, any sighting of the moon. And it's only when it becomes um, you know, a waxing crescent that it begins to make its appearance and to start to shift through its phases. And the moon will go through its phases um, over a 29 and a half day um, cycle. It, it averages 29.531 days. This is called a lunation or what is called a synodic month. And so the God's calendar, it alternates between 29 and 30 days every other month. And so one month you'll have 29 days, the next month you'll have 30 days. And, um, and so this, the way that God's calendar is set up is that when you see the waxing crescent first appear, that is the first day of the lunar month. This day is excluded from the next four weekly seven-day um, seven sabbatical weeks. And so... The waxing crescent is the first day of the month, 
And then you have seven days after that on the eighth of the month, uh, the first quarter uh, moon, and that's the first Sabbath. And then on the 15th day of the month, that's the full moon, and that is the second Sabbath. And then on the 22nd, you have the third quarter moon. That's the third Sabbath. On the 29th, that's the third, uh, that's the fourth, the lunar conjunctive Sabbath. And every month on the lunar solar calendar, according to Enoch's, um, and we put this all together for those that are interested. We have a Enochian lunar, uh, a seasonal lunar solar calendar which makes all of this easy for you to understand. And we have broken down and compiled and interpreted each day of the Gregorian calendar and made it um, correlate to what is the Hebrew lunisolar calendar. For instance, we're in the month of Elul right now. And then on, um, we have, the Yom Turah, the the Feast of Trumpets coming up very soon, and I can actually pull it up on our calendar. And you can find our the calendar also on sacredwordpublishing.net. You don't you don't have to um, purchase it. You can keep up with the calendar there. But for those that are interested in having one for your wall, we did create it in print form, and you can purchase it to get to know better the Hebrew months and how they are set according to the phases of the moon. And so I'll share with you, for instance, the upcoming feast days for those that, you know, want to know when those days are going to occur and how they're going to occur. And so today is the 2nd of September. And as I said, it's the 22nd day of Elui, and it's the sixth month, the Hebrew month, the 6,000th and first year, and this is the third quarter Sabbath. On the 9th of September, that will be the 29th of Elui, and that's the lunar conjunctive Sabbath. And then we'll have the 30th of Elui, which will be the 10th of September, and then on the 11th of September, interestingly enough, that will be when the, we see the waxing crescent moon. And so that will be Rosh Kadesh for the month of Tishri, which is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. And that is Yom Turah, the Feast of Trumpets. And then you have 10 days thereafter on the 20th of September, the Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And then uh, five days thereafter, on the full moon, the September 25th, we have the full moon Sabbath with its, the 15th of Tishri, and that is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so uh, for seven days thereafter, you have the uh, the Festival of Weeks, which is the Feast of Sukkot, and that will continue until October 2nd, which is the third quarter Sabbath, the 22nd of Tishri, and um, and now I'll just continue till next month, just so you can see how the Sabbaths, according to the Gregorian calendar, they're incorrect, because uh, if you do not have your calendar connected to the moon, the Sabbaths change according to what day of the month, it, uh, the, what day of the week it is. And so, for instance, this month we celebrate Sabbath on Sunday, but next month we'll be celebrating Sabbath on Tuesday. And then the following month, October, we celebrate Sabbath on Wednesday. And so... The end of the uh, the Sukkot, the Festival of the Weeks, which is a seven-day festival, just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover uh, week is celebrated from the 15th, the Day of Unleavened Bread, to the 20, uh, 22nd. 
It's the same thing here in the month of Tishri. Uh, the Sukkot is celebrated on the 15th and it continues for seven days to the third quarter Sabbath, which is um, again here October 2nd. Then on October 9th, we have the 29th of Tishri, which is the lunar conjunctive Sabbath. And this particular month will be only 29 days. And so instead of having the 30th day, the translation day, we have the very next day, which will begin the Hebrew month of Chesvan, C-H-E-S-V-A-N, the eighth month in the Hebrew calendar. Rosh Kadesh for Chesvan will be on October 10th. And I know this is slightly confusing for those that are not used to following the lunar uh, calendar, um, but it's only because we're so used to the Gregorian calendar. And as I said, because the Gregorian calendar has been divorced from the movements of the moon, Sabbath is actually the way that most people honor and celebrate Sabbath is incorrect. And so Sabbath and the Levitical feast days are all lined and determined by the phases of the moon. And so, um, again, if you want to know more about this particular topic and also how to honor and calculate and determine when Sabbath actually occurs, you can look to our Enochian seasonal lunar solar calendar, which you can find on lulu.com or on our sacredwordpublishing.net.com. Um, and also in my ninth book, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch, I explain in great detail uh, how I was able to decrypt the entire book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. Um, but I explain what the calendar and why it's important to honor and follow it this way and to and how it is that you can determine and to um, follow Sabbath correctly uh, according to wherever you may be just by looking for and citing and watching for the waxing crescent. Thank you for your question, Kylie. Okay, so to follow up with that question, um, just checking, did Yahushua actually follow the Sabbath. He was accused of not following the Sabbath. Did he actually follow the literal moon, the crescent moon Sabbath? Yeah, absolutely. All of the the Jews that were alive during his time and the Hebrew people, they all followed a lunar solar calendar as I've uh, stated and shown here. And that this calendar was also reinstituted and given to Moses and the Hebrews during the Exodus. And I proved that and I can share a show where I confirm that because it tells us that um, in during the Exodus, they honored the Passover on the 15th, which it's only by determining um, Sabbath according to the lunar solar calendar that the Sabbath, uh, the the Feast of Unleavened Bread occurs on the full moon and that it's a Sabbath every, you know, every calendar year, not according to the Gregorian calendar, only by the determination of the Enochian lunar solar calendar. Because as I said, every 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th is a Sabbath. And in the Levitical feast days that are cited in chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23, we see that unleavened bread is always celebrated on the 15th of Nisan. And on the Feast of Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, it's always celebrated on the seventh month, which is the month of Tishri, on the 15th day. And it's only when you follow a lunar solar calendar that Nisan 15 and Tishri 15 are always a full moon Sabbath, according to, you know, the, the phases of the moon as they occur on the Enochian lunar solar calendar. Uh, on, a, on the regular Gregorian calendar, 
Sabbath is every seven days. And there is no exclusion for what is the Kadesh, the waxing crescent, and the appearance of it. And so right now, uh, um, as I said, even though the Christians are correct, because Sabbath is actually on Sunday this month, next month it will be on Tuesday, and the month after that it will be on Wednesday. And so they're only correct every once in a while. And that's why if you're not following the Enochian Luna Solar calendar, uh, for instance, the Jews, they celebrate Sabbath from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown. The Seventh-day Adventists, they celebrate Sabbath on Saturday, and the Christians celebrate Sabbath on uh, on Sunday. And so they're only correct about one in every seven months, um, which again is why it's important to understand and to follow the calendar as Enoch lays it out in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. And as I said, I help people to understand that and to uh, decrypt everything he talks about with regard to the calendar and the motions of the greater luminary and the lesser luminary that are cited in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries in my flat earth as key to decrypt the book of Enoch. And so people can go to that book for greater clarity on how it is I came to understand the calendar and how it is that we were able to plot it and to create this uh, Enochian seasonal calendar, which it begins with March when the sun's on the vernal equinox. And it's a linear progression, spring, summer, fall, winter. We don't begin our calendar in January in the middle of winter because God's calendar begins in March with the beginning of spring. And it's linear, spring, summer, fall, winter. It ends in February and it begins in March. And that's the way we have our calendar set up. Excellent. All right. Sorry, a little glitch there. Uh, Chris P. Wings asks, may Zen speak about Bible codes and or the purpose of numerology? Any insights would be appreciated. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, numerology, when you look at the, again, the ancient Hebrew, each one of the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet, the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews did not have different letters and different numbers. The letters were numbers, and each one of them had a numerical value. And so the numbers also had significance with regard to numerology, which is where we have the origin of such study. And so even with the way that the Hebrews interpreted the ancient scriptures and the translation of them, they had a numerical value that each one of the chapters, when they were creating or making copies of the original Hebrew Torah, it had to add up to this numer numerical value, or they knew that it was off in some manner. And so um, that's how they were able to keep in precision their translations of the ancient manuscripts, because they would add up each one of the letters after writing down a particular chapter or a particular passage, and if it did not add up to the correct numerical value, then they would throw out the entire manuscript. And so uh, just like each one of the letters of the alphabet also has a particular symbolic meaning, just like with the name of the Tetragrammaton, uh, Yahuwah, uh, Y-H-V-H, that it means behold the hand, behold the nail. And so in the name of the Tetragrammaton, we have the prophecy of the coming and the crucifixion of Christ and his ascension thereafter, how he would be Savior Messiah. 
And so in the name of the Father, we have the, the re revelation of Christ, uh, behold the hand, behold the nail. And even in the name of Yeshua, Yahushua, his name means Yah's salvation. And so, uh, which is exactly what he was. Uh, John, when he, when Christ came to be baptized in the River Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And the reason he said that is because, uh, as it says in the Thracian script in the first book of Adam and Eve, Adam and Ua, it says that Christ would be the Word and he would be the Lamb that would bring forgiveness to all the sins of humanity. And he was that lamb because, as I said, the Levitical feast days, as we celebrate them, as they were given to Moses uh, in the Exodus and also in Leviticus, um, Passover was the first, uh, it, it's always celebrated on Nisan 14th the 14th of Nisan, which is the day before the full moon. And so Passover, it, as the Hebrews celebrated it, and as Christ celebrated, it always accompanied a full moon. Um, and, and that's why, again, it's important to follow the lunar solar calendar so that you can keep up with when to determine and when to actually celebrate the feast days on their correct days. And so the 15th was always a Sabbath, and it was always a full moon Sabbath. And then the 16th was the day of first fruits. And then we had Pentecost, 40, or what is cited to be believed, uh, everybody believes to be 49 days later, but in actuality, in Leviticus, it tells us that we are to celebrate Pentecost the day after the completion of seven perfect weeks. And so that when you understand the correct uh, interpretation of the calendar, and I'll bring this up to give people a better understanding, because this is important to understand too. So let me show you how it is that we determine when we are to celebrate Pentecost. Because it's always on the 9th of Sivan, the Hebrew month of Sivan, that Pentecost should be celebrated. And I'll help you understand that. Okay, so this year we had the Pesach, which is the Passover. It occurred on the 31st of March. That was the 14th of Nisan. And then on the 15th, it was the 1st of April, the 15th of Nisan, which was a full moon Sabbath. And then Yom Hibberkim, the day of first fruits, the 16th of Nisan occurred on the 2nd. And so you have the counting of the Omer beginning with the 16th of Nisan, which again was the 2nd of April. And so what people don't understand about how to determine Pentecost is that in Leviticus, it tells you that you have the passing of seven complete weeks. And that's according to the lunar solar calendar. And so what most people don't add into what is the, uh, the counting of the Omer is that you have to exclude Rosh Kadesh, which is you know the sighting of the waxing crescent moon, because that's not counted in the counting of the Omer, and also translation day. And so let me explain this. So from the 16th of Nisan to the 29th of Nisan, which occurred on the 15th of April, that gives you 14 days for the counting of the Omer. 
And then on the 16th, we had Rosh Kadesh for the month of Ayar, which is the second month in the Hebrew calendar. You do not count that in par as part of the counting of the Omer. So the 16th being waxing crescent, the appearance of the waxing crescent, that is excluded from the seven day counts. Because remember, it's only the four sabbatical weeks which are included in the counting of the Omer. And so the 15th day of the Omer actually begins on the second of Iyar. And so that was the 17th of um, April. And so that's the 15th day of the counting of the Omer. When you look at our calendar, this will make a lot more sense. But I'm going to try to explain it to you really quickly. Um, and so from the, the 15th day of the Omer to what was the end of the, the particular calendar, um, the second month, the Hebrew month of Iyar, it ended in the 14th of May, and that was the 29th of Iyar. This was the 42nd day of the Omer. And then on the 15th of May, you have the 30th day of Iyar, which is translation day. That is not included in the counting of the Omer because it's only, again, the seven perfect seven-day sabbatical weeks that are part of the counting of the Omer. And then the Rosh Kadesh for the month of Sivan occurred on the 16th of May. That was the first day of the third month of the Hebrew calendar. And then you pick up counting the Omer with the 17th of May. Um, and that was the 43rd day of the counting of the Omer. So you see you have three days that are not counted in the counting of the Omer, which was Rosh Kadesh for the month of Iyar, Translation Day for the month of Iyar, and then Rosh Kadesh for the month of Sivan. And so if you add these seven perfect weeks, you see that the, the counting of the Omer always ends on the 49th day of the and which is always the first quarter sabbath and it this occurred on the 23rd of may and so it was the the ninth of Sivan, as i said which was may 24th of this year that's when shavuot or pentecost occurred and so you always have to count the seven perfect Sabbaths, excluding the Kadesh and translation days. And so it's always that because the seven perfect weeks, it's always the first quarter Sabbath is the 49th day of the Omer. And so the 50th day is always the ninth of Sivan. And that's when you celebrate Pentecost. Um, if people look at our calendar when you determine what I just went in great detail to explain, it will make a lot more sense and it will be easier to understand. But that's how you determine the correct day for celebrating Pentecost. Oh, one other thing with regard to the Bible codes, I forgot, sorry. The Bible codes are an interesting aspect of the inspired word because they show to us that God has encoded prophetically all the events of prophecy and all the events of creation, even things that are occurring in this day and age. For instance, I write about and show in my book on the firmament and also the flat earth as key to decrypt the book of Enoch how it was that I was able to find encoded into the Bible codes that Cain was a child of the wicked one. And also I found flat earth and firmament Bible codes. And in my opinion, the Bible codes being um, 
divinely inspired it's only by divine inspiration that they could be encoded and for those that don't know what the bible codes are um it is called ELS equal letter sequencing which means that you can put all of the letters of the Hebrew bible together word you know letter by letter by letter taking out all the spaces and all the punctuation and then it will create what seems to us a puzzle and it's only by using a computer that you can then search for skipping for instance you can every 50th letter or every third letter or whatever that the bible is able to find these codes um, spread out over the hebrew torah and a lot of times they will reveal things that have occurred in the past or things that will occur in the future um, a michael drosnan who wrote the first book about the bible codes he showed that many of the ancient uh, prophets and the rabbis of old were encoded into the bible codes and a lot of times you'll find very secretive and prophetic knowledge also encoded into the Bible codes. Like, for instance, um, the Michael Drosnan found the name of Yitzhak Rabin, who was the prime minister during, you know, the time when he had written his book. And he found also that Yitzhak Rabin was going to be assassinated. He found this encoded into the Bible codes. And he sent this information because he had a friend that was um, a, a, a friend of Yitzhak Rabin, who was the prime minister of Israel during that time. He sent this information to him, but because the Bible codes were not understood and were not um, believed as being prophetic in nature, Yitzhak Rabin did not take any precautions or take the information as serious but he in fact was assassinated and so that actually showed the veracity of the bible codes as being prophetic and inspired in nature and so there are many things with regard to the bible codes that um you know show that only the most high god could have inspired them um and that things could be Examine. There are many, you know, computer programs now that allow you to search for Bible codes, and there's many people that have done that. And as I said, I verified the the teaching of not only the flat Earth and the firmament, but also Cain, who was a a, a wicked one. Um, I found several Bible codes in and you know also show how you can search it out for yourself in my books and you know in my opinion that is god confirming that this knowledge is truthful and so people can look to my books for greater clarity on how i was able to search out these bible codes myself and you can do it yourself i tell you how to go to the particular bible code search a website and you can type in the same terms and find exactly the same codes that I found and verify them for yourself in the same way that I was originally able to find them. All right, another one from Brian Barbecue. Does Zen feel there may be the ability to reach awareness of who we are before we drank from the cup of forgetfulness on a deep individual level can we search and wake to awareness on our own like coming out of amnesia or is this a gift allowance of the holy spirit to know this as yah's will for you to know regardless of how hard we search uh, in my opinion it is seeking and searching and having that inherent hunger to know and to come to remembrance that does overcome drinking from the cup of forgetfulness because when we are born into the flesh and for those that know about my teachings on pre-existence 
it is my opinion that all of us had spiritual embodiment before we ever came into the flesh and that we were angelic beings before coming into flesh form and that when we enter into this lifetime then we are required to drink from what i call the cup of forgetfulness and then our memories and all of the things that we had knowledge of previous to coming into flesh and that we had uh, as memory in our spiritual embodiments that all of that is wiped away and that we forget the things that we knew previously. But however, these memories and this knowledge, in my opinion, are burned to the very fabric of who we are and that our soul retains access and memory of such knowledge. Some people call this the Akashic records or you know, the, uh, the library of knowledge. Um, th this is also, you know, referenced as the books of life too, that the knowledge of everything that we do and everything that we have done, the knowledge of the memory of all of creation going all the way back to the beginning. Because we, as immortal bright natured beings, we do go all the way back to the beginning to when the Most High God, the pre-existent Godhead, created all of the spirits and all of the beings that are now part of creation. And all of this occurred on the first day. Even as I brought up the book, The Legends of the Jews, in The Legends of the Jews and also in the Book of Jubilees and many other places, it tells us that all the spirits of humanity and all the spirits of all the elements and all the different creatures and beings here in the world were all created on the first day. And as, you know, even Jeremiah was told by the word of the Most High God, he said, I knew you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother. I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. The same thing applies to all of us. It says in the scriptures that God knew us before even the foundations of this world. And so all of us, in my opinion, pre-existed in some spiritual embodiment before we ever entered into flesh form. And that it was in these spiritual embodiments that we were tempted and that the war in heaven occurred. Christ tells us that he saw Satan like lightning cast from the heavens. In the second book of the book of the secrets of Enoch in chapter 29, it tells us that the rebel angels, the one third of the angels which joined Lucifer in rebellion, they were cast out on the second day. And it was then that they were placed under the authority of death. If you look to Psalms 82, it tells us that the sons of God, which we were part of that, and I'll actually bring it up here. But in Psalms 82, it tells us how all the angels of the Most High, which I believe we are part of that group, all of the angels of the Most High were tasked and were going to have to enter into flesh and that we would all be sentenced to die the death of man, as it says in this passage. And now I'll share it and help you to understand a little bit better about preexistence. But yes, I do believe that in studying the word and studying the scriptures and in going into your prayer closet and to seeking the most high God, that the Holy Spirit will lead you to recollection and to remembrance and that you will be able to understand and remember those things that I'm speaking about now and that all of us, in my opinion, have these memories burned to soul and that is just a matter of gaining access to that knowledge, uh, that that insight 
is with us. This is the reason why we experience deja vu, because the knowledge of those occurrences are already with us. And that deja vu, in my opinion, is just God's way as, of confirming to us that we are on the correct road. And so it says in Psalms 82, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And so when you look up that word gods, it is Elohim, which in my opinion is part of who we were. And the ministers of the Most High God, the celestial hierarchy, the angels which serve the Most High God. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Salah? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. The all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Now, that particular passage is telling us that, again, the when the sons of God came under the authority of death was when the foundations of the earth were out of course. When was that time? You read again in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is when the earth's foundations were all out of course, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So God is telling us in this passage, they know not, neither they, will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. This is when the war in heaven occurred, and that is what led to the earth becoming destroyed and the, us walking on in darkness. And then it says, I have said, ye are gods. That's all of us, sons of gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. That prince was Lucifer. When he was cast out with the rebel angels, they were placed under the authority of death. This is why it says in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 that Lucifer will die the death of a man because he has been placed again under mortality, under flesh embodiment, and he will die just like we all have coming into flesh embodiment. We live one lifetime and then judgment, as it says in Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 9, verse 27. And so in John chapter 10, verse 34, I believe it is, Christ says, are you not, are you not as gods? Uh, so he's reminding us of Psalms 82, and he's telling us in that passage that we also are Elohim and that the reason he knew us before we ever entered into the womb of our mothers uh, is because we were Elohim, that we preexisted with him. And that's how it is that he knew us before the foundations of the world. If you read Ephesians chapter 1, it tells us that we were predestinated and that through Christ we would have salvation and eternal life as long as we came to remembrance of who we are, why we are, and what all this is really all about. I published in great detail information on our preexistence in my two books, Sons of God and Skyfall, which I know that those books were out of print and they were being sold for exorbitant prices on Amazon. But for those that are interested in studying and learning more about preexistence, we have now republished them in both soft and hard book format. And we've made them uh, easy to access. They are printed for cheap. And so you can gain access to all of that information uh, now and again, and you can study all of the information that I put together to help people to come to this remembrance and to remember who you are, why you are, and what all this is all really about.
Okay, we are nearing two hours and I don't see any more questions at the moment. Did you want to continue or did you want to wrap? No, I think that's good. Um, that this is a perfect place to kind of end it. And, um, and you know, I think two hours is appropriate. So I just want to thank all of you again for joining us and for sending us your questions and for sharing your commentary. We appreciate all of you and thank you for fellowship. And uh, we look forward to sharing, you know, more um, insight and introspection in this manner with all of you, giving you an ac you know, access and chance to ask us questions. And uh, anything you need to want to know more about, please just send the questions and we'll incorporate them into this monthly discourse, um, you know, as far as the, the Discord channel. And we'll share with you all of um, the questions and the answers. And, and we'll also publish that in you know, as far as show and share them with the rest of the world. So thank you again. We appreciate all of you. And I do think that we talked about um, getting together as a more community type uh, fellowship in the voice lounge on a weekly basis at this time on Sunday nights. So not as an AMA where Zen has to be on stage, but more as us just communing and talking and getting together, but in the voice lounge, everybody can talk and we just get together and be a community on Discord. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good thing to be able to fellowship in this manner because a lot of people are looking for like a, a church type setting and are not finding that fellowship in these mainstream organized establishments. And so as the Ecclesia did previously, where two or more gathered in Yeshua's name, that that really is the church of the first century. And that this platform is giving us all a chance to kind of gather in that manner. And so it's uh, bringing to light what they did um, in the early formations of the church back in the first century. I am going to take Craig out so he will no longer be recording and you are all welcome to go to the voice lounge. If you want to still hang out, you will no longer be muted so you can all chat. It will not be recorded and you can commune there if you want to do that yet tonight. And then again, we will be doing that again next week as well. Thanks everyone. We appreciate all of you. Thanks for taking the time to join us. God bless all. Good night.